Hello everybody and welcome back for our second presentation of the day. Uh, for those who have just joined us, uh, please make uh, use of the chat window you'll see uh, inside of the screen there to introduce yourself and ask any questions throughout the presentation or post a specific question for the Q&A under the question mark. Um, so I'd like to introduce our, our second speaker is Boyd Fowler, uh, CTO of, of Omnivision. Uh, and one of the uh, one of the world's leading experts in image image sensor technology. So over to you, boy. Good afternoon. My name is Boyd Fowler, and today I'm going to talk about high performance automotive image sensors using CMOS wafer stacking technology. The outline for my talk is shown here. First, I'll give you a bit of an introduction to the technology, as well as give you a motivation for why is it important in this area. Then I'll talk specifically about wafer stacking technologies that are available today. Then I'll talk about one of our products, the OX-03C wafer stacked automotive CMOS image sensor. In this section, I'll discuss both the architecture of the sensor as well as the measured performance. And finally, I'll give you a few summary conclusions. Wafer stacking technology is really just the connection of two wafers, both electrically and mechanically. Sometimes there's two wafers, we could also have three wafers or even more. This allows us to have higher densities of devices than a standard planar wafer design. This also enables us to optimize the performance of our device so that we can make sure that the pixels can collect the photons appropriately, they can um, have very low dark current, they can also have very good read noise. But at the same time, we can optimize the readout circuitry so that it has very good power uh, considerations, it has very good speed as well as density. And in the past, if you look down here in the bottom uh, right-hand corner, you can see in the older technology, when we had backside illuminated devices, the pixels and the circuits had to be in the same substrate. So unfortunately, we had to have a balance between photon collection and then readout circuitry. And so in stack designs, we can optimize this so both the pixels as well as the readout circuitry can be in a different process. And this allows us to build better performance devices than we could in the past. To give you kind of an idea of what this means is we show here stacked versus non-stacked CMOS image sensors. The OX-03A is our older generation BSI device without stacking. And the OX-03C, which I'll talk more about later, is one of our newest devices that uses wafer stacking. And here we can see the same resolution. They're both about 2.5 megapixels. The um, OX-03A is a 2.3 micron pixel where the OX03C um, is a three micron pixel. We were able to, even with the smaller pixel, because of the wafer stacking, retain approximately the same full capacity, but at the same time, we were able to expand the dynamic range significantly by about 50 dB. And so we also were able to reduce the dark current by more than a factor of two from 20 to eight electrons per pixel per second. And we were also able to reduce the read noise by almost a factor of two also, from 1.5 electrons to less than one electron. And I'll talk more about the details later, but this is why stacking is so important because we can improve the characteristics and performance of our CMOS image sensors. All right, so let's talk about wafer stacking technologies. In wafer stacking technology, there are really two different techniques that people use, although they're very similar and in most ways are almost exactly the same. But the first and probably the most prevalent originally was what we call the TSV or through silicon via technology. And the way that works is that we have a sensor array, the pixels, so to speak, and then we have the readout circuitry underneath. We bond these wafers face to face at the silicon dioxide interface. And then what we do is we bore a hole and connect um, the metal layers between the two wafers as shown here. The newest generations though, what we do is we call a hybrid bonding. So we not only bond the silicon dioxide, but we also bond copper to copper. And this is shown here, and this shows kind of a, what we call a column level interface 
where at the columns we connect um, metal. And the reason it's a hybrid bond is because some of the regions are bonded silicon dioxide to silicon dioxide, and others are copper to copper. And if you look finally on the far right, you can see what we call the pixel level um, hybrid bond. And this is where every pixel can actually have a connection. So we can have millions of interconnects. And the first device we developed here was our voltage mode global shutter product back in 2018. So let me dive a little more uh, into the actual process flow that we used. So imagine here that we have two wafers. The top one is what we'll call our um, ASIC or readout wafer. And the bottom one is our image sensor wafer. This is where our pixels are. This is where the we have photon sensitive um, silicon. And what we do is we take these two wafers, stack them face to face. We bond them physically. The, um, the oxides are bonded together so that they're mechanically stable and connected. Then what we do is we etch the uh, silicon wafer that has the pixels in it. And this is for backside thinning. And we backside thin this down to somewhere between three to five microns typically. It could be slightly thicker, but in that range. And then we put passivation on there. After this, what we do is we etch. We etch a hole in the physical silicon itself, and then we put some oxide to protect it to the next stage. Now what we do is we take and we do a, actually a deep etch through the silicon dioxide to the different metal layers, okay? And this is going to enable us to connect this piece of metal on the ASIC wafer to this piece of metal on the uh, pixel wafer. And then what we do is we deposit copper and we connect these layers together as shown here. Then finally, we etch back the copper as you shown in this picture right here. And then we put passivation over the top of this. This makes an interconnect between these two layers. And then finally, we etch out the areas and the edges where the pads are so that we can actually do wire bonding. And this is a very simple um, description of how through silicon via um, wafer stacking actually works. And this is a post-processing stage. So before we do anything, we build our wafers and then we go through this process. Now, finally, I'd like to show you some of the results for this. So this is a, a typical um, CMOS, stacked CMOS image sensor right here. And at the edges, both here at the bottom as well as at the far right, this is where all of the uh, interconnects are, the through silicon vias. And this was the first technology that OmniVision developed, as well as most companies developed for this technology. And then here is an SEM, where we have a cross section of one of the through silicon vias. And you can see it connecting from a pad essentially, or a piece of metal that's in the bottom wafer to one that's on the top wafer. And this is, a, again, a very uh, similar picture to what you saw in the cartoons that we just showed a second ago. All right, so now that we've talked about wafer stacking, let's talk about how it's used in the OX-03C and what it actually allows us to achieve. So the OX-03C um, sensor architecture is shown here. And the really most important thing to talk about is our split pixel design. We have two different pixels inside of the sensor at each uh, photo site. One is a large pixel, and this is used for low light and most of the imaging conditions, we use the large pixel. But we also have a small pixel because unfortunately, we have LED flicker that occurs in many automotive situations. And to try to mitigate this, we need to be able to integrate for a long period of time, typically around 11 milliseconds or more. But when the light is very bright outside, it's very easy for the large pixel to saturate during that time. So what we do is we build a very small and insensitive pixel, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But it's very insensitive so that we can integrate for a very long period of time. We also integrate a capacitor here, and this allows us to do DCG or dual conversion gain. And although I won't talk about it in detail today, it's one of the key technologies that enables wide dynamic range for the sensor. The architecture for the sensor is shown down here. Here's the pixel array, and of course, this is one of the pixels inside of the array. There are column level ADCs, as well as row selection um, circuitry. There are temperature sensors, there's black level correction, digital gain, as well as um, high dynamic range combine, uh, auto white balance, there's a lens correction, um, there's also a digital pixel correction, as well as IO circuitry, there's MIPI. And there's some also additional circuitry like PLLs, timing generators, uh, some one-time programmable logic, 
voltage regulators, as well as a SPI interface. Actually, sorry, it's an I squared C interface. One of the most interesting things though for this device is the way that we actually combine uh, HDR captures. And we do this to try to mitigate the um, LED flicker. And so there are two different ways this can be read out. One we call three or four captures, and it ends up being called HDR4 or HDR3 here. HDR4 means that we take all four captures and combine them together, and HDR3 means that we combine three of the captures. And the capture that we don't include here is the small pixel uh, for LED uh, flicker mitigation. But in this uh, HDR3 mode I talked about before, we actually have a software mechanism for trying to detect flicker and trying to remove it. And we use this block down here to detect when this happens. We generate what we'll call a flicker map, and then that's used to try to mitigate the flicker that occurs in the, in the uh, scene. So just another way to kind of describe this is that at each pixel site, we read out the large pixel through two gain paths, a high gain path and a low gain path. We also read out the small pixel. And at the same time, we try to read out a very, very short integration time. So typically there's a relatively long integration time to get a good high quality signal. But for very high dynamic range, the very bright parts of the signal, we do what we call a very short. And this is the four different captures we talk about here. And then those go through an image combiner that generate our either HDR4 or HDR3 image data. This is an SNR plot of the device. And we see SNR and DB on the y-axis. And then this is pixel illumination on this axis. The first uh, graph here shows the response for the high gain part of the large pixel. And then the low gain response for that is shown here in the red. The small photodiode is shown in green, and then the very short is shown here. A couple key things to show here is that the dynamic range from one end to the other is around 140 dB. Also, the dip in the uh, SNR curve is another key factor, and it dips down to around 26, 27 dB, which is actually quite good. It means that you shouldn't see any graininess in the image because of the high dynamic range. Next thing to talk about is the quantum efficiency. On the left, we see the large pixel quantum efficiency, and you see a peak QE of around 65% in green. On the right-hand side, we see the small pixel quantum efficiency, and its peak is around 0.6%. So it's around 100 times less quantum efficiency for the small pixel than for the large pixel. And the reason, again, we do this is so that we can guarantee, even under bright conditions, we can integrate for a long period of time without saturating the pixel so that we can capture flickering LEDs and therefore mitigate this effect in the image. Another very key thing to look at on all image sensors is the thing we call the photon transfer curve. And because the collection of the electrons at the pixel is a Poisson noise process, if we plot the variance of the signal that we collect versus its mean value, which is shown here, we end up with a plot that looks like this, where the slope gives us the conversion gain. And the reason we do this is because twofold. One is we need to know the conversion gain for understanding the performance of the device. But second of all, if there's anything strange going on with the image sensor, you see it first in these curves. And you can see we show the red, green, as well as blue curves for photon transfer for both the high gain mode, the low gain mode, and the small pixel. All of them look actually very nice. And this shows the sensor is performing quite well and that the analog readout path is doing exactly what we would expect. All right, so the next thing to look at is read noise and fixed pattern noise versus analog gain. And the reason this is important is, first of all, we can tell kind of how well we do from a noise point of view. And you can see here that for high gain, we achieve noise down to about 0.8 electrons. And the fixed pattern noise is about 0.17 right here. If we look at the um, low gain channel, we have about five electrons of read noise and we have a fixed pattern of a little approximately one electron. And then for the small pixel, we see about five electrons also, but here we see a fixed pattern noise of around 0.6. And the key thing usually is keeping around a five to one ratio between the temporal read noise and the FPN. This allows the FPN to essentially be invisible for most applications. 
All right, so here is the specifications and performance for the OX-03C. The image sensor is a one over um, 2.3 inch format device. It's about 1.5 megapixels and runs at 60 frames per second. We have a three micron pixel. It has an RGGB filter on it, although that could be modified for our CCB. The output interface is MIPI as well as DVP. It has a read noise of less than one electron. I mentioned before around 0.8 electrons. The um, low gain read noise is around five electrons. The photo current, uh, sorry, the photo um, diode dark current is approximately eight electrons per pixel per second at 60 degrees C. This is quite a good number in comparison to what you saw for the old BSI technology. The peak quantum efficiency at uh, 525 nanometers is around 65%. And then the interscene high dynamic range for three exposures is around 140 dB. LFM coverage, yes, we have LFM coverage across the board. Um, and then we also have uh, functional safety inside the chip and it uh, adheres to ASIL C standards. And then finally, the power dissipation of the part running in HD mode or 1080p, um, 60 frames per second, is around 370 milliwatts. And this includes all of the LFM as well as the 140 dB HDR combination. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that wafer stacking enables optimization of both photo detection as well as readout circuitry in the same sensor. And unlike in the past where we had to make trade-offs in performance because both of them were in the same substrate, now we can actually optimize them independently. Wafer stacking also will continue to improve uh, CMOS image sensors. It will enable denser interconnections and more features and better performance for CMOS image sensors in the future. The OX-03C is a good example of the newest stack CMOS image sensors for automotive applications. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks, Boyd, for a fascinating presentation. Thanks for being here with us live for the Q&A. Uh, Thank you. It's always interesting for me to see the evolution of image sensors since I was running the image sensors conference about 15 years ago, and I know it goes back uh, a, a lot further than that. Um, so it's always exciting to see the latest developments. Thank you. We, uh, we have one question uh, in the Q&A, um, and I have a couple by email. Um, so. Uh, a, a familiar face to you, Albert Tuerson, has has a, a question. He's asking, um, in the in the photon <coughs> transfer curves, uh, the lines cross the vertical axis for a negative value. Uh, he says, I think this is not possible. The variance cannot be negative. That is absolutely correct. The variance should not be negative. Um, let me, can we go back to that slide specifically and look at it? Uh, I don't think we can do that with the video, but you can share your screen if you if you wanted to. Uh, I don't know if I have it sitting here, but Albert's correct. In the photon transfer curve, the variance should never be negative. If there's a negative value there, of course, there's something off by a little bit in the graph. Um, but uh, again, when you measure variance, there's no way for it to be negative. So he's absolutely correct there. Okay, th thanks for that one. Um, sure. So, so. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation about operating temperatures for automotive applications. Uh, can you tell us a bit more why that's important? Yeah, that's very critical. In automotive uh, applications, typically customers want to operate from typically minus 40 all the way up to 125 degrees centigrade. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, one of the most important factors is the dark current. Dark current is very sensitive to temperature. It doubles about every six to seven degrees C. So having very low dark current is key if you're going to be able to operate at high temperature. So minus 40, not such a problem. Actually, it's quite nice for the image sensor, but 125 degrees centigrade can be a significant problem. And so therefore, the reason wafer stacking is so important is because it enables us to continuously reduce the dark current in the pixel wafer without affecting the performance of the readout circuitry. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um... As I mentioned at the beginning, the thing, stacking technology is, is a very interesting area of innovation. Um, do, do, do you have a feel for what 
more can be done to uh, exploit this approach for, for uh, the automated applications in imaging? I think there are a lot of different things that are going to happen. I mean, one of the key things that happens in stacking is that it enables us to have more space to put more circuitry. So you could imagine enabling smarter sensors by putting more processing closer to the die so that you don't have to transfer all the data. You could also imagine using multiple layers to do something like having a rolling shutter as well as a global shutter at the same time. And so for some applications that might be very critical. So there are a lot of things that we're looking at currently that stacking technology enables that we didn't have in the past, but really making the chips smarter and giving them more functionality are really the key things that wafer stacking does besides the optimization of performance. Mm -hmm. Which of which of those features are we likely to see soonest? Do you think whereabouts are they in the in the pipeline? I would expect that smart sensors are going to be the things that you're going to see probably the quickest. Uh, people are already developing lots of technologies uh, that can be enabled from a digital point of view, uh, mm -hmm. and so. Being able to drop in a core that can do different kinds of processing that will help the chip be smarter for different types of applications seems like something that should occur relatively quickly, depending on the needs of customers in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I think we have another question in the Q and uh, A. Another another question from uh, Albert. In fact, so he he says uh, uh, you mentioned 140 dB of dynamic range. Um, what is a reasonable number for a real application, a real sensor with a real lens in front of it, he asks. That's actually a very good question. Uh, our customers tell us that they want 140 dB. My personal experience in the past is that with most lenses, it's hard to get above 120 dB. And that's just because of issues like flare and other things that occur inside the camera system. Mm -hmm. But again, it depends a lot on the lens design. It depends on a lot of other factors, uh, but Flare is a big issue, and when you start to look at scenes that have very wide dynamic range, often flare is what limits you before the image sensor limits you. Okay, makes sense. We have a couple more questions. Um, so Yongjun Wang uh, in the uh, chat is asking, uh, will the cost of making sensors increase with wafer stacking? So that's a good question. There is some increase. Uh, it's not a huge amount. You might initially think that it's a factor of two, but it's really not. And the reason why that's true is because in the past we had the pixel area and then around the pixel area, you had all the additional readout circuitry. Now what happens is the die size has shrunk to exactly the pixel array size and then everything goes underneath it. And the two layers don't always have to be from the same type process. So one can be much cheaper than the other process and so when you look at the total adder and cost, it's not as much as you might expect. And mm -hmm. so it's not a factor of two, not even a factor of 50%. It's significantly less than that. And as we go into high volume production, um, the prices obviously come down continuously. And just to give you an idea, this technology is being used in mobile, which is an incredibly cost sensitive marketplace. Mm -hmm. And we use it there everywhere. So I think that from a price point of view, this won't have a huge impact for most of our customers. Super, um, so we have time for one, one more quick question. Um, this is again from the chat. Uh, so Shiva Rai is asking, will we see NIR pixel integration for CIS in depth sensing? Uh, that's a good question, but I'm not exactly sure what he means. Um, I would say that uh, clearly people are working on improving the NIR response. Probably you've seen the work that Omnivision has done uh, in Mixel. And again, please go to our webpage, uh, www.obt.com, and you can take a look at all of our technologies there, besides the things I talked about today. And NIR technology is something that we've worked on, and we've done uh, some very interesting work in that area. Likely, if we ever build depth sensors, I'm sure it will be used there but I'm sure that other companies that are working on depth sensors will be looking at technologies that are similar to improve their performance. Super, so that's about the time for us. Uh, thanks very much for being here for the Q&A and for your detailed and very honest answers. Uh, we do have one or two more that I'll pass on to you um, uh, that you can uh, respond to after, after the event, but uh, we need to move on to our next session now. So thanks again for being here. Really appreciate it and great presentation, Boyd. Thank you very much. 
Super. So for everyone who would like to uh, move on now to the next session, we have uh, the roundtable discussions, several different discussions going on. Uh, please navigate back to the agenda and find your uh, your preferred topic and we'll see you in there. Enjoy. Thank you.